Well, we're in a new teaching series. Uh, it's a short one uh, on worship. And we've been talking, but we said last week that worship is a super, super important topic in Scripture, but that the topic is so big and so broad that we can't cover all of it. And so we're just kind of trying to take a slice of this topic of worship. And so last week, we looked at this whole idea that what worship at its heart is, is surrender. It's saying to God, I will do and follow you however you lead me, because worship is bigger. It's broader than just singing on Sunday. We, we kind of all know that. And uh, we said last week that, in fact, our greatest act of worship is often how we surrender during the week, not what we do here on Sunday morning. So your assignment, of course, was to go do that. And what we're going to do is we're going to look next week, as we said, about the connection between our personal worship and our corporate worship. And then we're going to, the last week, we're going to look at the role of worship in, in singing when we gather together. But today, I want to look at this, the elements of a worship-filled life. It's kind of like um, baking a cake, okay? If I was going to bake a cake, you could show me a picture of the cake and say, this is what a good cake looks like. That's not all that helpful, right? You need direction. So you would need them to say, okay, well, you have different ingredients that you need to make a cake, right? You need your baking soda. You got to have your flour because you got to have flour. I mean, it doesn't work otherwise. You got to have sugar. In some cakes, it's white sugar. In some cakes, it's brown sugar. Some cakes, it's both. Uh, salt, weirdly enough, in a cake. Uh, they may even need oil. Sometimes it's butter. Sometimes it's margarine. It really depends. Then you might add eggs. And then you have to actually follow the directions on how to mix them, right? If you mix them in the wrong order or you don't put them together right, it doesn't taste right. So you have to have the right ingredients. You've got to put them in the right order. And then once you have it all mixed up, you have to know how long to bake it, what temperature to bake it at. And see, these are all important. I, I remember I was probably 12 years old, 13 years old, and my mom let me bake a cake. And I remember following the directions putting the oven, and then opening the oven every three minutes to check my cake. <laughs> For those of you that have baked, you know that doesn't work really well. I couldn't figure out why it wasn't doing what it was supposed to. Again, you need instruction. And so I think about that sometimes when I'm thinking about this idea of worship, because when all that happens, when it's all together, you end up with this delicious, amazing and last week we said, well, worship is surrender. It's surrender to God. It's obeying. But what does that look like? I mean, what does that mean? If you're, if you're going to have the directions, because it's so easy to overcomplicate it or to miss out on things. But we want to get this right. Because a cake that has flour and eggs and no sugar doesn't turn out the way it's supposed to. So let me pray for us, because we're going to take a look at the elements of a worship-filled life. Lord, thank you for what we've seen this morning, how you were at work, that you have given us a vision into the things that you are doing in and through our church and the people of our church and their faithful service to you. We are so grateful for that. And Lord, in so many ways, everything that this, these people that we are doing is an act of worship to you. But we want that to go further. We want it to go deeper. So would you speak to us this morning? Amen. Well, last week we touched on a verse in Romans. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time on it, but I want to I camp there a little bit today because it's, it's, uh, when Paul was writing to the church in Rome, he, he started a new section's letter, and it started out like this, very familiar verse to most of you. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... To offer your bodies a living, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your true and proper worship. This is what we talked about last week, surrender, sacrifice. But Paul knew exactly what we were talking about here for the people there. He says, but they need to know what does that mean? What does that look like? And because he knows that people need specifics, that this was not enough, he goes on. He continues his thought. Here's how it goes. He says, don't conform to the pattern of the world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone, you don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. 
For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to others. So, what are the elements of a worship-filled life? If we're surrendered to God, what does that look like? And I think at a broad level, and there's probably more, but in this section where he's talking about your spiritual act of work, worship, Paul points out four things, four elements of a worship-filled life that I think will help us and kind of give us the ingredients. Here's the first. A mind, a worship-filled life is characterized by a mind that constantly looks to understand and see things anew in the light of Jesus. You notice what he says. He says, don't conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's saying, look, your spiritual act of worship, you know how that happens? Don't interpret your world and your actions and your thinking through the lens of what happens around you. In other words, if you're looking around at the world around you and everything you read on the, on the news, on the BBC, that you watch on Fox or see on CNN or hear in your Facebook group, he says, that doesn't decide how you think. It shouldn't. He said, and rather what I want you to do, and you do need to learn, you need to continually learn, that's part of our thinking. But he says, I want you to change how your mind views your circumstances, letting Jesus be the one who determines what you think. That means the determining factor on how we view our world, our country, the people that irritate us, the situations that make us angry, the activities we do, how we view ourselves, the determining factor on how we think about all that is what Jesus says about all of it. And we all nod and think, yeah, of course, this we do, but we don't do that. And stopping and saying, no, I need to renew my mind. God, what are you thinking? Jesus, what do you see? How do you see them? Because I see nothing good in them. What do you see? Let them inform your thinking. To worship and surrender, one of the elements of that kind of life is to let Jesus inform all your thoughts and ideas instead of letting your preconceived notions and everything that someone else is telling you Decide what you think. And when we do that, it leads to number two. A will, then, that applies Jesus' thinking to my actions. Paul doesn't just say, be conformed in your mind. He says, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. There's an action there that says, okay, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to apply Jesus' perspective on my life, and then let that inform what I do, what I say, how I act, how I respond, the way I react. I am not at the mercy of my instincts. It's not just who you are. I've heard that many times. Ah, that's just who I am. I had someone say once, you know, they, they acted, reacted very forcefully at times. They kind of just said what they wanted. They didn't really care if they hurt people's feelings. And they said, eh, it's just who I am. People have to get used to me. No, it doesn't work that way. He's like, you want to worship me. You have to understand how I think and then let that inform your will. And so what a worship-filled life, one of the elements of a worship-filled life is a will that takes seriously that when Jesus says, I want you to serve others and put your interests before, their interests before yours, that you do. That believes what Jesus says about who I am. It allows me to act in boldness because I actually believe what he says about me. The worship-filled life combines the elements of the mind and the will. But Paul isn't done. In your, in your Bibles, a lot of times there's a little heading here. It is verse 1 and 2, and then it goes into a new section. But Paul didn't do that. That, that. that section is a little bit arbitrary because it connects to what he says next. He says, here's what I want. Your worship-filled life, the elements, are a mind that's listening and, and interpreting things through the ways of Jesus, letting that inform their will. And then he says, and here's why. It's because you need to be sacrificially serving other people in relationships, using Jesus as your model. He goes on right after this to say, hey, by the way, this is because we are one body. And he has this whole teaching on we're one church. We're, we're different members. We don't do the same things. We don't see things the same things. But when we are all collectively getting the mind of Jesus and acting that way, we do it to serve each other. You want to worship and have a worship-filled life? Serve each other the way Jesus served us. As he says, that's what you're supposed to be doing in Christ. This way, using his power, that's how you do it. Worship is never just a solitary experience of singing songs, praying, or adoring God on your own. That is incomplete worship. 
They're crucial, they're important, but the outworking of a worship-filled life is always expressed in how we relate to the people around us, always. Paul actually says in this that we belong to each other. That means your primary responsibility is not to you, it's to other people. Totally contrary to what our words, our world says. A worship-filled life, one of the elements of that is a life that takes that what God has shown us in our minds, let it inform our will so that we can then serve other people. Which leads to the last element of a worship-filled life, which is simply this, emotions that are informed by our worship. When it comes to worship, there are two camps. There are those that are just very emotional. They love emotions. It's wonderful. And they define their worship experience by their emotions. Then there's the other side which says, emotions, emotions. We've got to do it. It's the Baptist way. We just follow God. We do what he says. It doesn't matter if you like it or you don't. They're both wrong. Because emotions matter. In fact, if you read through the rest of this section where Paul fleshes out, you should see, look at the number of things he uses, the terms he uses. Do something diligently, cheerfully, generously, joyfully. Be patient, have fervor, have passion, rejoice, mourn. He's describing how worship works itself out in your life. But our emotions, which we want to utilize as God gave them to us, are informed by our worship, not the other way around. Someone said once that emotions are great passengers and they're lousy drivers. Because emotions are amazing, they're useful, they're part of our worship of God. He wants all of us, and that includes our emotions, but it's decided, we say, but they're not going to rule. They don't decide, but they're going to be used. Be patient, be joyful. Just because we're supposed to think and then have an act of the will and serve does not mean that emotions aren't critical. And you know this, because the last time you were a wreck and your life was broken, you didn't want to lecture you wanted someone who would mourn with you. So feel and feel deeply, but let them be influenced or affected or steered by what you know about Jesus. And what he said. Now, if I was to sum this all up, we said last week worship is surrender. It's surrendering our thinking. It's surrendering our will now. It's surrendering our emotions. It's surrendering to feel And I was going to preach a little bit more on these topics, but I went through the week and I thought, there's a danger here. And here's the danger. You could easily walk away from this kind of teaching with another list to do. Okay, I get it. These are the ingredients. I got to do that in my life. And then we feel this obligation, and if I don't do this, I'm not worshiping right. Or guilt because I'm not doing some of these things. It hasn't been the pattern of my life. And in both cases, it puts the onus back on us. And I think it misses the point of worship. Because I wonder if our worship and our attention to surrender every area of our life would change if we grasped the significance and the amazingness of who Jesus is. Jesus once told Philip, one of his disciples, who really wanted to know, he said, Jesus, we want to know what God is like. Tell us what God is like. Show us the Father. We want to understand him. And Jesus has this famous response that simply says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Have you really seen Jesus lately? <sighs> Once when Jesus was in the temple courts, the religious leaders, they, they brought a woman to him who was caught in the act of adultery. Maybe you know this story. And it was in front of all the people and because he was teaching the crowds and people were staring. They bring this woman. She's caught in the act So she was humiliated. She was caught in her sin. She was wrong. And people are staring and they're accusing and they're despising her. And the religious leaders, they're just using her. They don't care about her at all. They're just using her because they want to get to Jesus. They want to prove that he's not who he really says he was. They want the crowds to turn against him. And so they are using her to discredit him. They could have cared less. 
you remember the story, they said, hey, Jesus, she sinned. We caught her. Everybody knows, according to the law, we're supposed to stone her, kill her by throwing rocks at her head. What do you think? And if you remember the story, Jesus bends down and he writes in the dirt. And they keep badgering him. Jesus, come on, give us an answer. Should we kill her or should we not? And do you remember? And Jesus paused long enough. Do you remember what he said? Whoever has never sinned, go ahead and throw the first rock. And then he bent down and he kept writing until everyone left. And when he, they were all gone, he turned to the woman and he looked at her and he said, where are your accusers? Didn't any of them condemn you? She said, no, nobody. She said, then I don't condemn you. Just go. Sit. Another time, after teaching crowds for many hours, Jesus separated himself from the crowds. He was dog tired. He was exhausted. He'd been doing ministry. And he told the disciples, we're going to go across the Sea of Galilee. And you remember, because he fell asleep. This is a great story. He fell asleep in the boat. And they, this tremendous storm comes up, and it's the kind of storm that was so strong that even these experienced sailors who had been on the lake their whole life, were, they thought they were going to die. They're like, we're going to be swamped, we're going to drown, we're going to die. And they woke Jesus up, and they said, help us. And if you've ever been on the water when there was huge waves, you know how scary this is. And with the wind howling and the rain sweeping across the lake, the disciples are exhausted, and they're wet, and they're fearful. And Jesus simply says, be still. disciples can even process this, they arrive on the other side of the lake and they're met with this naked, crazy, wild, demon-possessed man who's been cast out by his friends, whose life has been wrecked, who isn't in his right mind. This is a man who would cut himself as a way to damage his own body because he couldn't stand who he was. And Jesus goes right at this man and frees him. And he brought peace to his soul. And even though the miracle was amazing, the people said, Jesus, you got to leave. Go away. We don't want you here. Rather than resist, he graciously got on the boat and left, having stayed long enough to impact one. And they said, go to the whole family and just tell them what Jesus did. Early in Jesus' ministry, after preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and there was a whole ton of people around him, Jesus is approached by a man lepers. And we have no context for this in our, in our culture, but this man was an outcast. He probably had grown up with family and friends and a job, and one day he woke up and the spots were on his skin, and they said, you got to get out. The law said you could not be around. It was from a day when, when that was how you kept people from catching the disease. And so lepers were ostracized. They were, they were cast out. They were forced to live far away. They couldn't approach anybody without yelling that they were unclean. People spit at them, threw rocks at them. They wanted them to stay away as far as possible. They lived a life not only ostracized mentally and emotionally, but physically because no one wanted to get near them. And this leper heard something because he came up to Jesus in the middle of a crowd. He took a massive risk because people would have wanted nothing to do with him. And it said Jesus touched him. This man probably hadn't been touched by a healthy person. They can't even walk straight. They have broken teeth. Their hair is unkempt. And we were like, eh, we want to take a step back. And Jesus went right at him and he touched him. He said, Lord, if you're willing, you can fix it. And Jesus not only touched him, but you were never supposed to do. He says, I'm clean. Be clean. He restores him to health. Changes his entire life and the outlook for the remainder of to a religious leader's house. It was a chance for this religious leader to get a good look at Jesus, to kind of evaluate him. So he invites him in with all of his uh, rich friends and they're having dinner and the kind of dinners they had back then, they would lay with their feet kind of stretched out to the outside. They would be gathered around the table. And in these cases, the people who are 
allowed to come and stand along the edges and listen to the wisdom of these rabbis as they share. And you've heard this story too because a woman comes in and they just call her a sinful woman. This is a woman who had wrecked her life. She had made bad choices. She spent her whole life with guilt and shame because she knew who she was. She knew the mistakes she'd made. Nobody around her was giving her any credit. She was known as the sinful by Jesus that she's standing there listening and she just begins to cry and if you've ever watched someone cry and weep you know how messy that is because it's not just in here that they change stuff comes out everywhere sorry it's kind of gross and it's weird and it's uncomfortable and maybe you see that at a funeral and you're like okay I get it this is happening and as her tears begin to fall and snot comes out of her and she's dripping Jesus, and you see her fall to her knees, and she begins to take her hair because it's the only thing she's got, and she starts to wipe his feet. She pulls out perfume, puts it on his feet, and as she cries, probably the most uncomfortable scene you've ever seen here. You're like being in a four-star restaurant with all your friends, and then having this happen. The religious leader throwing the party immediately judges the woman. He judges Jesus. Jesus knows all that. He uses the opportunity to tell this amazing story about forgiveness. And in doing so, he rebukes all the people that are judging this woman. But what's amazing is what happens in the end. After all, he turns and for the first time he addresses the woman directly. A woman who had risked scorn, ridicule, to come face to face with Jesus. And he just so gently says, your sins
tastes amazing and is best enjoyed with grace. My friends, my family, worship is surrender. It's having a mind that wants to see things the way Jesus sees things. It's having a will that says, okay, I'm going to do it your way. Whatever it is, because that's what it is. It's a surrender. I'm I'm surrendering my mind, my will, so I'm going to use it. I'm going to serve other people in relationship. I'm going to use your example, and I'm going to let my emotions loose in all this. Give me honor by my worship. And do you know why we worship this way? Because Jesus looks at every sinful person who knows they've sinned, who others have accused, who know that they deserve nothing but the worst, and he looks at them and he says, I don't condemn you. I see you unlike anybody else does. We worship this way because no matter how stormy life gets, no matter how difficult it is, no matter what the circumstances are that we face, no matter how painful it is, Jesus with the word can say, be still. We worship this way because Jesus will cross a lake to meet with one person who is tormented by Satan and set them free and change the course of their life. We worship this way because God, Jesus, will touch the untouchable. He will touch you. He will touch anybody who thinks, I am unlovable. I have failed. I am a sinner. If Jesus just really looked at me, he would reject me. And Jesus says, no, I want to embrace you and heal you. We worship this way because Jesus doesn't care about your past or your social reputation or the sins that you've committed, but he sees 